Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Dominic Macri, and I'm the president of the Families First Foundation Board, and I'll be your moderator today. I want to thank everyone for joining our webinar as we think the information is very important, but also timely as our lives and routines have been changed with this pandemic. To be respectful of your time, we will keep this to an hour with uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, when this pandemic began, our first thoughts were how we can provide tips to help alleviate the stress and anxiety for families who are sheltering in place. Today, you will hear about some of the work being done to prevent child abuse right here in our community. As our community partners, we want to provide you with up-to-date and accurate information on abuse and neglect. You will hear from two of our clinical directors, as well as our CEO, on the life-changing work Families First is doing during the crisis. But first, let me introduce today's panel speakers. Uh, Julie Swindler is our uh, Chief Executive Officer. Andres Torrens is our Clinical Director for Behavioral Health Services. Melissa Wingard is our Clinical Director of Child First. And Samantha Whiteman is our Director of Development. A quick review of our agenda. We'll, uh, get, Julie will give a quick overview of the Families First organization and what we do. Um, Andres will provide some tips to dealing with anxiety and stress. Uh, Melissa will provide a domestic violence, suicide, and food insecurities uh, update uh, within our community. And then we will go to question and answers with some closing remarks from Sam. So uh, with that being said, I would like to introduce Julie Swindler, the CEO of Families First and a licensed clinical social worker. Julie became chief exec executive officer at Families First in 1992, two years after its inception. Throughout her career, Ms. Swindler has continued developing skills in program design and implementation, as well as remaining current on clinical practice specific to infant mental health services and the social, emotional wellness of children birth to five. Take it away, Julie. Thank you so much, Dom, and thank you all for participating with us, um, especially with it being Child Abuse Prevention Month. And before um, I go to a Families First update, I, I want to thank Andres Torrens and Melissa Wingard, who are experts in the field of trauma, and will be able to share um, with you the work of Families First. I have the privilege of serving our community and agency for 30 years now since its inception of Families First, which has impacted over 44,500 families since 1990. The agency provides child abuse prevention, health, housing and behavioral health services for families with children prenatal to age 22 who struggle with domestic violence, homelessness, drug or alcohol abuse, mental or physical health issues, community violence, or other challenges that put their children and families at risk. The philosophical approach is from a family systems perspective and one that is intergenerational, which incorporates every member of the family unit, the community and systems that impact the development of the child. We know that children who experience more positive interactions in their early years go to be healthier and more successful in school and in life. Unfortunately, the opposite is true as well. Poverty exposure to family violence and lack of access to quality early learning experience can ne negatively impact a child's early brain development and subsequently their long-term success. Families First is here to partner with families in repairing and restoring relationships with their children as they identify their needs and goals toward positive growth and development. At this time, I wanna thank you all very much for your partnership, for the donations that we've received from the community to continue our work and the positive impact we make together in the communities that we serve. Thank you again for joining us and I wanna turn it over to Dom. Thanks, Julie. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Andres Torrens, the Clinical Director of Behavioral Health Services for Families First. Andres has more than 25 years in the field uh, and has a Master's of Social Work uh, and is a licensed clinical social worker. Andres has received extensive training on the subject of child sexual abuse and trauma, 
Mr. Torrens has presented nationally and internationally on topics of sexual abuse, families recovering from trauma, recovering from trauma, and cultural insensitivity. Thanks, Andres, for being here with us. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Julie, for that uh, nice those nice words. So my job here is to introduce you a little bit as to um, how stress and anxiety is playing havoc on our families and on our children. Over the last month or so, families have been taxed to the max with respect to COVID-19 and being uh, confined to their homes, their lives pretty much being turned upside down. So my job here is to introduce you a little bit of two, as to stress and anxiety, what these two symptoms are, syndromes are, and, and some ways uh, that our families are coping or maybe not coping with this. Next slide. So first, let me introduce you a little bit about stress and stress and what stress is. So stress is any event or force or condition that requires us to act or cope or enhance or, or, or introduce our coping strategies. It cannot be defined independently. Stress results in our autotomic nervous system releasing hormones, our sympathetic branch of the system releasing additional hormones. These hormones that are released into our bodies are known at, um, as cortisol, norepinephrine, and adrenaline. These, these uh, enzymes, these um, hormones are short-lived and they are put into the body in order to give us energy, in order to act on the stressor that has been introduced into our life. It results in energy and they are long-acting. The receptors in the brain respond and signal us to either slow down or speed up. Cortisol is naturally released in our bodies overnight, so it, it allows us to uh, wake up in the morning, but we don't need a whole lot of cortisol at, uh, in order to, during the day in order, because it will prevent us from sleeping and from falling asleep at night. Chronic stress throughout the day will result in higher doses of cortisol that the body does not need. So what, is a no what, is a, what would normal cortisol levels do? It would rise, it would cause a rise in our blood pressure, our pulse, our blood glu glucose levels. With individuals, I do a little bit of work with children with type one diabetes and individuals, adults with type two diabetes, and this plays havoc on their bodies with respect to their blood glucose levels. It slows down the digestion. It results in unpleasant emotions uh, in, in the body, uh, it, and which, it, which really is our, our body's way, our brain is going to start to tell us, slow down, take time for yourself, take time to recover from this. What can you do? What, have, what are your coping skills? So some of these coping skills could be relaxation, listening to music, exercising, having fun. A lot of things that have been taken away from us or have not been thought about when it comes to COVID-19 and being quarantined. Next slide. The impact of stress is depicted in this, uh, in this diagram that I've put here, uh, that I've given you. So stress will reduce our, our healthy eating. You see a lot in social media about people engaging in eating um, comfort foods and, and foods that they normally don't eat, consuming a little bit more of the alcoholic or the adult beverages than normally. So that's what, cause, well, that's what stress would cause. Obviously healthy eating in reverse would reduce our stress levels. Getting enough sleep at night reduces our stress levels. Stress reduces our ability to exercise. We don't want to go out and do exercise and engage in healthy um, exercise when we are stressed out, but we know and we have to push ourselves in order to do that. And stress can reduce our quality family time. So spending some quality time with your children, with your families. Yes, I know we are all quarantined with our families uh, throughout the whole day, but it means changing it up a little bit. I saw a family out this morning doing some runs and doing some obstacle courses at eight o'clock in the morning outside. So being, and, and all the mom said was, we're just trying to be creative. So that's what this means. We have to be creative to find new family time. Next. Another slide, uh, this depicts the physical symptoms that our body endures as a result of stress. There's a, there's a host of different syndromes that sometimes doctors won't be able to identify. They won't be able to identify a cause for high blood pressure, for um, intestinal problems, for depression, for chronic fatigue. So a lot, if you read a lot about COVID-19, 
they, they introduce you to a lot of these different syndromes. So people are thinking, oh my God, do I have COVID-19? No, what you, well, you might, you, you, you're going to need to be tested if your doctor says so, but you also might be under high levels of stress resulting in headaches, resulting in chronic fatigue, in hypertension, um, a lot of issues, a lot of symptoms that, is also, that are also related with, with uh, COVID-19. Next. So some normal reactions to stress, and, and to an abnormal situation. So stress is a normal response to an abnormal situation. So one thing that's on this slide that I really wanna call attention to is, our, is the effect on productivity. So not, a, not only adult, the effect on productivity for our adults, for us, but it's the effect on productivity for our kiddos. Our children have been quarantined and have been engaging in uh, long distance learning since March 31st. So they have been home and in school on their computers for about a month now. So stress and our children are stressed. They may not show it. They may not demonstrate this as easily or as visibly as we do as adults, but our children are stressed and that can automatically result in the inability to concentrate, the incidences of, of errors in their schoolwork, the lapses of memory. They're not able to ret retain as much information. So we know that these are issues for us as adults, but now these are becoming real issues for our children in, in, uh, who are engaging in uh, long distance learning. A little bit about, about anxiety. So anxiety is a psychological and a physiological state. It is normal. It's a normal response to stress. Again, high levels of stress are not healthy for us as are not as are high levels of anxiety. When, when stress becomes overly, overly, you know, too high in our bodies, in our brains, it's going to result in an anxiety disorder and, or in anxiety. Too much anxiety in our system will result in, um, sorry, you sped right, wait, <laughs> sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is characterized by cognitive and somatic symptoms, emotional and behavioral components, and an uneasiness of fear and worry. Our children are worrying more than ever. They're worrying about what's happening to them, what's happening to the world. They might be hearing information that their parents are talking about or that they're overhearing on the news that their parents are listening to or their caretakers are listening to. So they are worrying. They are worrying about, will I have food? Will I have a home? Will my parents be okay? Will my parents get sick? If they get sick and they die, who will take care of me? Our kids are worrying a lot these days. Next slide. Next slide. So the consequences of COVID-19 on families are an increase in stress and anxiety. It can result in some mental health symptoms. We are seeing that a lot of our families are experiencing increased bouts of anxiety, of depression, of anger outbursts, of impulsivity. Adult caretakers are engaging in more self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. And the problem with increasing their, their intake of drugs and alcohol is that the children are, gonna, are home now witnessing this. So they are witnessing that their parents are increasing the use of drugs and alcohol. And with the increase in drugs and alcohol, oftentimes comes the increase in violence and coupled discord and, and discord in the family resulting in calls to law enforcement. With the increase in calls in law enforcement, our children are now being um, scrutinized or they, they be, they, we're seeing that the children are being traumatized in their homes by this uh, increase in fighting, increase in exposure to drugs and drug use and alcohol use. And there's no way out for these kiddos. They are home just like the rest of us. They are not engaging in play dates. They are not going across the street to a, family, to a friend's house. They are staying home. So they are now being uh, witnessing all of this going on in the home. So what happened, sorry, go back one slide. So it, what we have seen is we have seen a decrease in the number of calls to the child abuse hotline. They have decreased by 40 to 50%. This does not mean that the incidences have decreased. In fact, the incidences of child abuse and neglect have increased since the, since the beginning of this pandemic. So why are they uh, not, why are the calls down? The calls are down because Typically, the people that call, make these calls are people that have their eyes and ears on the children, which are the teachers and school officials. So being that they're not in school, if the calls are dramatically down, but that does not mean that the, that the children are not being exposed to incidences of child neglect or child abuse in the home. Children we know are experiencing a, a high degree of stress and anxiety, just like parents, but they're going to look differently. 
they're going to look, that you're going to see that your children might start to regress. They might become needier at home. They might need uh, to be around you a lot more often. They might be impulsive. So the older kids, the, the, the adolescents and the teenagers might be engaging in more risk-taking behaviors because they're bored. They don't know what to do while they're home. So, um, unfortunately, online predators are taking full advantage of the fact that our children are home on their computers. So they're taking full advantage of that and trying to engage kids online any way they can, posing a great risk to our children. So what is Families First doing? Families First is providing telehealth and teletherapy to our families. We are now the new eyes and ears in these homes. We are providing case management and teletherapy and telehealth to our families and providing it in a culturally sensitive way. Many of our families were not used to and are not used to communicating via technology. They're not used to communicating with someone on a computer looking at a, at a light or a camera which is, on, which is connected to their uh, computer. So we needed to introduce them to this technology, to this new way of, of operating. This is going to be unfortunately or for a, a new normal for many of us. So we had to provide this information, this psychoeducation to our families and to our teachers and faculty as well. The teachers needed to know what was going on with their children, with, what, with the children not paying attention, with the children not being on camera in the classrooms. So we needed to provide the same psychoeducation to school officials, the teachers, and we needed to, and we started providing our families with vital resources. We understood and, and learned very quickly that our families were not going to necessarily engage in teletherapy or telehealth services while they were hungry, while they needed the, the, the uh, concrete services, the tangible goods at home. So how are we doing this? We're doing this with, um, with my staff. Next slide. We have a staff of, of mental health professionals on our team. We have 10 therapists that are providing um, counseling and therapeutic services via telehealth to our children in schools as well as in the community. And many, most of our families, 98% of our families have engaged in telehealth services, which is wonderful because they have not skipped a beat. They've actually encouraged us to continue to stay with them, to call, with, call them, because they are also um, going through a lot of worrying and a lot of fear over this pandemic. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dominic. Great. Thank you, Andres. Uh, I'm sure everyone can relate to many of the symptoms you mentioned in your presentation and likely are experiencing or witness, with, witnessing them as we all deal with this pandemic. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them in through the Q&A link on the top of your screen. Uh, I would now like to introduce Melissa Weingard, the uh, clinical director of our Child First program. Melissa is also a licensed clinical social worker and has a master of social work. Uh, Melissa has exper expertise in the field of infant mental health, early intervention, and child parent psychotherapy. Uh, maybe you should come over to my house and help me deal with my kids after this. Uh, she has also conducted training, uh, conducted trainings all over the state of Florida for clinicians and parent educators on infant mental health, specifically the areas of behavioral observation assessment with children under five, uh, early intervention, and social emotional development. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dominic. I um, have been asked today to speak a little bit about some of the challenges that we are seeing in the field, some of the challenges um, that our families are exposed to, and the challenges for the workers who are going into the home. I currently am the clinical director for Child First, which has a team of clinicians and care coordinators who act as case managers, who go out typically into the homes doing home visiting to um, do a variety of interventions, therapeutic or educational with families. We have had to shift our focus and we are now doing all of our work via telehealth. So our home visiting is virtual. With that shift, we've noticed um, a big practice change and some very serious incidents and situations going on with our families. So I'd like to highlight a few of them and um, my staff's response to those issues in the homes. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about issues from the field. Um, our staff is no stranger to working with violence in the home. We have always encountered domestic violence as a social issue that happens within a lot of our our homes and our clients. What 
With COVID-19, we are experiencing some barriers to service delivery and we are seeing an exasperation and a much higher incidence of domestic violence. What is hard for my workers going into the home via telehealth is that there's really a lack of privacy for our clients to communicate with us. This is typically an issue that we would um, see with domestic violence. However, now with everybody being in the home all the time, it's become a very serious issue and we are having trouble getting any kind of privacy with regard to individual therapy. Um, we're seeing an increase in isolation for the, um, for the survivors and for the victims of the violence. Isolation is an issue with domestic violence. It is what a abuser is going to try to do in general. It's a characteristic of that kind of relationship and with COVID-19 and the current circumstances, this is a strongly on the increase. Uh, we're also seeing a reliance, um, can you go back, thanks. Reliance on the perpetrator for the survivor may increase. This is a particularly concerning uh, situation. We have clients who we've been able to assist with getting independent housing, maybe they've got their own job, They've been, we've been able to arrange for childcare, transportation, so we historically have been able to reduce the reliance on the perpetrator. However, losing your job, not having school, not having aftercare, all the resources that have led to somebody being self-sufficient when they're not there, if there's nobody else to rely on, sometimes it has to go back to the abuser. So that's a huge challenge. We see financial manipulation. Often the abuser is the one in control of the family's finances, um, of most of the decisions within the family. So when they're in charge of the banking, they have the stimulus check, they get the tax return, even couples who are not together anymore. The, the abuser might still be the one who has received the stimulus check for them and the children, leaving, um, the, leaving the mother with no resources. Um, a huge problem that has always been associated with domestic violence, but is particularly concerning right now, includes digital stalking. Digital stalking is where a perpetrator will be, have access to all things technology for a client, text messages, looking at emails, knowing passcodes. So we need to be extremely careful as providers when we think about how we are sending information. Just sending the National Domestic Violence Hotline phone number, asking questions, are you safe, are you okay? If your abuser sees those, that could lead to a uh, danger for the survivor. We are seeing a lot of circumstances where multiple families or families who have many, many family members are now quarantined together and they're not used to everybody being home all day. Some have lost housing, had to move in with their sister-in-law, had to move in with their brother and now they're being exposed to violence that may be in other relationships within the family. So we have particular cases where um, children are being exposed to domestic violence from their aunt and uncle because the family has to live there. So they're stuck, isolated in their room, can't go out into the kitchen, can't go out into the living room. Um, so there's many issues and barriers going on right now with our work with domestic violence survivors. Next. So how, how can we help these families? What are we doing? Um, my staff, we are accepting phone calls at non-traditional work times. Sometimes we have to be conscious of somebody who maybe we have a particular client when she drives to the store at seven o'clock in the morning, twice a week, she's alone. That's the only time that she's alone. That would be when we talk to her or check in with her. Um, and someone driving to work, driving home from work, taking the child to an appointment, if there's an opportunity where we might have a special ringtone that we assign to a certain client, so we're alerted, this is an important call for me to take. She might, you know, maybe now is when she can talk. We are, we don't send written communication, text messages, emails um, to certain clients because we are concerned that someone's reading their email, so we're conscious of that. We will work with families to help develop co-parenting plans for separated couples who have had a history of violence. There's often situations where dad has kids on the weekend, mom has kids during the week, dad would pick up from school or daycare on Friday, drop back after school on Monday. So, you know, original plans included that they would not be encountering each other, but with the schools being closed, that's not an option anymore. We'll help identify family members or friends who can assist with custody exchanges that might have been done through 
some of these public institutions, professional services, family court, public places were traditionally a good place to exchange custody. Not very crowded anywhere right now, so that safety and numbers thing is kind of out. So we've had to problem solve with some of this. We are providing social support through frequent phone calls and check-ins. Someone who might have had one 60-minute individual therapy session with a, with a parent a week, that might be broken down into three 20-minute sessions so that we kind of spread out our response and we help to reduce isolation. It is important for us as providers to be updated on all local and national resources, including their availability, shelters, any kind of things that might get filled up and um, are not going to be able to help our clients, and also how to access them because a lot of access has changed through different virtual channels. What else can we do for our clients? We really, our goal when it comes to domestic violence when working with families is reducing reliance and isolation. Those are the two key words that we try to think about. We can help them to get bus passes still. We, have, we can purchase and provide them with strollers. Just a stroller for a woman can be a lifeline having the availability to put the baby in the stroller and walk out the door when she needs to. Maybe even having that daily time to take a walk alone and to call us and talk. Domestic violence is not something that generally happens on the first date, even the first month of marriage. It is something that escalates and it runs in a cyclic. So helping families be, with us to be non-judgmental and just problem solve and provide safety. We can provide gift cards for food and hygiene. So uh, women who are not, do not have access to the finances or who have been financially manipulated by their abuser, we can provide safety through some, of, some um, relief. Discussing emergency shelter, emergency hotel placements, um, and in extreme cases, sometimes we've had to do police well-being checks when we haven't been able to reach somebody. We can use a code word in session. We'll have certain women, if we speak and I hear her say the word avocado, I know that this isn't a time she can talk. Oh, when Dixie was out of avocados today, change the subject. A code word for safety, something like that. Um, link to virtual support groups. There are some places that are putting together virtual support groups for domestic violence. YWCA is one of them. So helping them to link to that to, again, reduce the isolation. Assist with childcare planning. There are daycares that are still open. There are not that many, but there are some. So helping with scholarships, enrollment, if that's something that's the safest way for a parent to work or do what they need to do. Um, discuss support networks, explore babysitting options that maybe they haven't thought of before within their own social system, system that are not related to their abuser. Something that's extremely important for staff providing telehealth is to watch out for red flags in sessions. You're on a video conference, if you're talking to a family via telehealth, noticing a broken things in the home, a hole in the wall, any kind of broken, anything broken you can see. Um, someone who says, oh, I can't talk to you via video today because my phone was smashed, the screen is smashed. Um, my phone is broken, that's a pretty typical one that alerts us to a red flag that we're gonna wanna ask more questions. Uh, abrupt conversation change when the presence of a certain family member. Domestic violence is not always husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend. There are, we have to be alert to all different patterns of adult relationships. Brother, sister, mother, father, grandparents, um, many, many, any relationships within the families that um, the adults have. We have one particular family where it's a sister-in-law that is the abuser in her family. And we have a client who has to live with her sister-in-law. So different, different things we, we want to be um, just alert and watching these patterns. Isolating in a bedroom, kind of locked up, shut into a bedroom, wondering what's going on with that. That's a little concerning. Avoiding showing your face on telehealth. So if a client, hey, I can see the ceiling. Why can't I see your face? It's easier for me to have a conversation with you if we can look each other in the eye. Can I see you? Um, I, I can only see half of your face on the screen. So some things that are, these are just red flags that we're paying attention to and avoiding sessions, especially maybe after we've had a serious conversation or spoken about something or had a disclosure of violence, then not being able to reach somebody would be very concerning. So 
ensuring that my staff is mindful of red flags and patterns so that they can uh, um, ensure that my clients are aware of it. The cycle of violence is extremely important. It's not typical in a domestic violence type relationship that every single day is full of violence and terror. It happens, but it's much more typical that you're kind of going around in a cycle. So you're good, not so good, good, not so good. And we wanna take every opportunity we can to present our clients with psychoeducation about domestic violence if they meet red flags and, and they're somebody that we're concerned about. These staff use supervisors, use me to process observations, patterns, and concerns within the family every day. The second issue that I wanna talk a little bit about is suicidal ideation and the exasperation of mental health symptoms. With the country in general on a heightened state of anxiety, those clients that we have who have issues of depression and anxiety are particularly vulnerable. Next slide. So generally, if we had a client who was staying home, not taking their kids to school, not going to work, not going to the store very often, saying no to social contact, avoiding people, we would feel concerned. Those are signs of depression and isolation and loneliness. And that is what the country is doing right now. So those people who have a pre-existing condition of depression and anxiety are particularly vulnerable and their mental health is at risk with all of this isolation. Um, staff, my staff are seeing an increase in psychiatric hospitalizations for our parents who have a history of depression. We, um, in the past six weeks, we have had a few Baker Acts of clients, so um, suicidal. Um, we've had a few parents who we had to call mobile crisis out to do an assessment to check on their well-being and make sure that they didn't meet criteria to be hospitalized. So being very aware of the parent's health and what's going on with them, because that is really the only way that we can ensure that the kids are safe. Some issues that we're having in the field when it comes to mental health, we have a lot of clients who don't have insurance. They don't have insurance, and so they can't qualify for a lot of the telehealth uh, programs. They, there are families and um, parents who were able to afford co-pays or sliding scales for therapy previously, but now with this epidemic, their financial circumstances has changed and it's no longer something that fits into the budget. So therapy is the first thing to go. There are a lot of public mental health facilities who are not accepting new clients. Um, they kind of put a hold on taking new clients while they got a handle on the ones they already had, or they have a wait lists for therapy. Sometimes our caseworkers are referring for therapy and I hear they're not able to reach someone to follow up. They're not able to reach someone to share information. They're kind of getting lost in cyberspace. So issues with intake virtually for a lot of agencies. Um, some of our clients just have a strong resistance to telehealth, to teletherapy. It doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel right. Um, it's not gonna help me. So they're just not doing it. Uh, there's a huge concern because a lot of our trauma victims are really re-traumatized or triggered by this pandemic. When you felt unsafe in the past and now you're feeling unsafe even for a different reason now, it's going to give you a trigger and a reminder and that's kind of an exasperation of symptoms. Staff response. So we, what can we do who we are providing therapy to the children and and parents. Uh, we are doing increased screening of the parents, formal and informal screening. We have um, suicide, depression index. We can apply those in a session if we have privacy, if we have time. If we don't, we just ask, do an informal assessment. We can work with safety planning, making sure there's no weapons in the house, finding out who else lives in the house, who can you talk to, what if you feel this way, here are some phone numbers, here's a suicide hotline each person developing their own individual safety plan. We are often looking for an emergency contact information for our parents. We generally view our client as the child, so the emergency contact is the parent, but if the parent is the one that we're concerned about their health, we might ask for an additional emergency contact that we can contact regarding them. We can do more frequent phone calls and check-ins with our vulnerable clients outside of session or divide the time as I spoke of before and do more, more frequent shorter sessions. The number one thing that I encourage my staff to do the best and most effective intervention is to talk about it. You have a client who has a history of suicidal ideation, who has a history of self-harming, check in, don't be afraid to ask the questions. 
Next slide. So the third issue that I'd like to talk about that's really um, a huge deal within our community is food insecurities. We have often had families that we work with that had food insecurities, that money was tight and groceries were tight. These families could get meals at school um, and maybe had more access to food in the community and their grocery store. Um, we have a lot going on when it comes to hunger in the county and what we're seeing there's a loss of work for those in the service industry, a lot of our restaurant workers, a lot of our farm workers, house cleaning, hotel service, a lot of layoffs and the people just aren't, they're not getting their house clean. They don't want someone coming in. That cash is not being paid out. Many of these employees are paid under the table. They're not going to qualify for unemployment. Their taxes aren't accurate. So a loss of cash income is a huge deal. A lot of our clients don't qualify for public assistance and some of them don't qualify for a tax refund or a stimulus. So basically a lot of our families, no cash comes in, there's no way to buy food. Next slide. Um, families first, what have we been doing in response to this? We've been able to deliver gift cards for families to go to grocery stores, to go to Winn-Dixie or to go to Walmart. Um, families who even we talk about the food distribution at the schools. There's an issue with that with a lot of our families in that they don't maybe live close to their local school. We have family out in the Glades whose kids get bused over to Loxahatchee, to Wellington. So showing your student ID, you have to drive 45 minutes for a meal. Um, there's also some that don't live close enough to the school to take the stroller and walk over there or take five kids and walk over to the school. I know one family in particular we had who every day was walking three miles for the free lunches um, just because it, it was a necessity. So giving the gift cards has been a huge help for families. We have situations where we've had staff actually go food shopping for some very special cases and delivering the food to the family's doorstep using the gift cards that we have as donations. We have parents with medical issues. We have a few parents undergoing chemotherapy who have cancer. We have a parent with MS. We have parents with immune compromise. So they, they can't be at the grocery store. It's not safe for them. And they're the primary and only caregiver of the children in the home. Their health is very important to maintain. So those are some families that we have gone to the store for, ask them some of the things that they like to eat typically and try to provide them large bags of beans, large bags of rice, some meat, some canned vegetables that can help sustain them for um, a little while. We have some single parents who have multiple children. So a mom who has four kids going to the grocery store in the evening, it's, it's a juggling act. It's a lot on a regular day, but with the pandemic, it's extremely hard and having the kids not touch anything. Some of the stores require all masks. So there's a lot of issues with that. We've been able to deliver groceries to some of those families. We have isolated families living in very rural conditions and some of these areas, the store doesn't have supplies. So early in the pandemic, especially, I know when Dixie out in Belle Glade was lacking in resources tremendously. So we would um, buy some necessities over here in West Palm Beach and drive them over to some of our families out in Belle Glade and Pahokee. Families that have a lack of transportation, again, to be able to get from a very rural residence in Belle Glade to the store is already something that takes a long time. And when the store doesn't have anything, it's been a wasted day. So that lack of resources in the western part of the county has been a big issue that we've been tackling. Uh, we are assisting families with online applications for food stamps, unemployment, child care, or emergency cash assistance. Families who maybe didn't qualify for these types of assistance before or didn't want them, they're now at back against the wall needing the public assistance. This is for those that are lucky enough to qualify for such funds. We have to help, as um, Andres mentioned, a lot of our families might not be so tech savvy. So we have to help them even create an email address and learn how to navigate all these systems virtually. There's a lot of families of grandparent caregivers or rural where they, you know, their response is to go to DCF, go to WIC in person, apply for things. You can't do that anymore. So we've had to teach them a whole new way of accessing um, services. 
I think what it all boils down to at the end of the day for all the workers who are out in the home and out in the field is that each family needs individualized help. Each family has unique issues that they might not tell you the first time you meet them over a phone face to face. So taking your time, getting to know them, watching for red flags, asking the questions and creating individualized support plans for each family is the key to helping families through this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I think both yours and Andres' presentation really shows how people in our community are experiencing this pandemic extremely differently. You know, some people have the resources that they can get through it without having any issues, uh, whether it's a car or finances, um, or, or there's a lot of people that don't have the resources that really need help and assistance during this time because, um, as we know, there's a, a lot of the funds that are, are being sent from the government are not getting to some of these folks until May. Uh, so it's, it's a long time from when this first started to now. Um, and you provide a lot of great uh, warning signs for us to take a look at and make sure we're, we're cognizant of those things uh, within our family and, and as we interact with uh, other family or friends uh, via Zoom or FaceTime and things like that. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, submit them now. We did have a few questions that Andres was kind enough to uh, to tackle. Um, one of them was, uh, how do you get our services if you need them? And so Andres, would you like to answer that for the, for the overall group just to let them know? Sure, thank you, Dom. So uh, many of our services, we, we have some very generous funders uh, and donors and, and the funders allow us to provide services that our clients do not have to pay for. So if they qualify for services by being a youth, by being a child, so we, we work primarily or most with children and their families, so they can come under one of those categories. We accept Medicaid, so we, we can accept the child that has a Medicaid plan that we accept. But if, they don't, if we don't accept their Medicaid plan, we can put them under one of the other categories, one of the underfunding streams. We also we have um, the Child First program, which, which receives referrals uh, through through the Healthy Beginning system, and, and Melissa can address that as well. But they simply, you know, will call our number, our main number, or go on the website and send an email through the website to one of the programs to, and, and ask a question that way. And I will I will get that email. I will get, it will come straight to me if you go into the behavioral health tab on the on the website. Okay, Melissa, did you want to add anything, or did Andrews cover everything? Yes, the Child First program, the um, way to refer to Child First is to call the county helpline for children at 211 or to reach out to Home Safe or um, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies and ask for a referral to Child First. That's the program that has a care coordinator and a therapist come into the home and the children need to be five and under to qualify for the Child First program. Great. Now, I know that we have a very diverse staff and they have uh, not only talent from a uh, caregiver or a provider perspective, they also are multilingual. What, um, what uh, languages do we, are we able to uh, help with or uh, participate for clients? So for the so Child First program, the, the services can be delivered in Creole, English, and Spanish. Okay, great. I was just going to add that our, we have, you know, one of the most diverse staff um, you know, in, in many agencies. And so we're very privileged to have staff that speak multiple languages. So English, French, Creole, and Spanish. And uh, we're able to meet the needs of many, uh, many families of different cultures and, and languages. Great. Another uh, question just came in. Uh, is Families First getting more calls for assistance recently? Or is social isolation resulting in fewer calls for help? I think for Child First program, we've had a steady flow of referrals. It's not overwhelming, but um, I think we have a few families a week being referred for the um, Child First program overall in Palm Beach County. Andres, do you want to add any? So yeah, they, so um, our families who we've been working with have, have um, they, they have a lot of trust in us. So they have, they have reached out to us so the social isolation hasn't prevented them from reaching out to us for assistance. 
However, families who have not been linked to us yet don't know us as well. So they, they, there may be fewer calls coming into us, but they're, they're called, those calls are going into local churches or other local um, donors in the community who are then reaching out to us. So they, they are putting these families in, in contact with us indirectly. Great, thank you for answering that. Um, there was a question about a copy of the slides. We will pro provide, uh, this is being recorded, so we'll send a, a copy of this presentation out to the email list as well as some additional information about Families First. Another question, um, any tips for connecting with a high school youth who has been missing in action since 331, since no social media, no response via email, calls, or texts? That seems like a long time, so. So I, I'll, yeah, I could take that call on. I could take that question on, Don, because that we've been, we've worked, we work in two high schools. And what has happened with these young people um, in high school, when they're 16, 17, even 18, 19, their parents, obviously, or some, not obviously, many of their parents are not connecting as regularly with their youth. So when we call the parents, the, especially of the 16 and 17 year old, because those are the numbers we have, they're just saying, you know, what, what can I do? He's, he's on his own, she's on her own. So we, we, I don't know what to tell you. So we are, um, we are doing some creative things. So we are connecting with the schools. So the schools know how to get in touch with these youth. They have emails and they have phone numbers for the youth that we were not aware that they had. So that's one way of connecting with them. We've learned that a lot of our uh, families have had to make the very difficult choice of either buying food or paying for their phones. So although there, haven't been, there hasn't been a phone call and we haven't been able to get in touch with someone, we, we, we celebrated after finally hearing from them and they said, I'm sorry, I couldn't afford to put my phone on. So it is back on. So, so please stay in touch with us. But if you miss, if, if, you, if this happens again, it's because I just <laughs> haven't been able to pay for my phone. And we've also been doing what we call drive-bys. So it's not something that, you know, the CDC would recommend because they're recommending that we stay quarantined, that we stay in our homes. But we have been doing some drive-bys with our, you know, to the family's homes, or we've been doing some wellness checks. So in, this, in the more severe cases, we've been asking law enforcement, especially of a youth who has been Baker Acted in the past, who has been more fragile, we've had law enforcement do a wellness check and go by the home to check to make sure that the family is doing okay. Yeah, and I think to your point, uh, th there's a lot of resources that people don't know are available. And so um, if you are, you know, not able to pay your phone bill, you should contact your provider because they are likely will give you a three month deferral or some kind of help through this time. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize that if you contact your financial institutions or creditors or, um, you know, uh, phone providers and things like that, if you are in danger of losing some of your services, they usually will work with you uh, through that. Um, another question that came in is, what is the average workload uh, of your teams that you guys have um, for both Child First and Peter um, For Child First, we generally, I find the teams to have between 10 and 16 clients, typically, the families, depending on how big the family is and, and what the issues are and how often they need to be seen. We also have um, different teams that at times are busier than others. Our Spanish speaking team is definitely our busiest team and they generally carry a case of about 16 clients. So our caseload is very similar. Our caseloads in the schools are a little bit higher. There are about 18 to 20 students and that's because they're all local. We have a therapist that's co-located inside of a school. So all of their clients are inside the school. Now that they're um, out, now that we're doing telehealth, the, the caseloads have remained the same. So we've we've pride ourselves on maintaining low and very manageable caseloads because we we really do stress the importance of not overwhelming our staff, of not uh, in in unethical ways taxing our staff and and causing an inability to reach out and to stay in touch with our families. So we pride ourselves on maintaining those relatively and very manageable caseloads so that they can stay in constant contact with this, with their clients. That's really important to know. Um, in addition to that, kind of a piggyback to that question, someone asked, you know, a lot of the staff is themselves are be obviously being quarantined or our family members or, or parents, you know, caregivers, things like that. 
um, how are they taking care of themselves from both a physical and a mental health perspective? Um, I think self-care is a huge topic of uh, supervision with me, with my staff. Um, each of my staff members receives three hours of supervision a week. That's uh, one hour of individual supervision, one hour of team where the case manager or care coordinator and the therapist are together with me. And then we do an hour as a full group. There, we also have an open door policy in my program where the staff can call me anytime if they need to discuss anything. Um, Self-care is certainly a topic that I cover each week. Um, we're encouraged to use sick time if we're not feeling well, or um, if you feel or, like that you don't feel good and you can't deliver sessions, we problem solve sometimes. Um, to do some paperwork one day, limiting the amount of telehealth sessions you're gonna have in a day. So um, really not having more than four or five therapy sessions via technology during a day would be my suggestion, balancing that with paperwork. Um, so it's a topic we're constantly covering. Andres, did you wanna add anything else on that? No, she, she put it very well. We, we, we are staying in touch with our, our staff and we are providing our staff with very similar information that we provided here. So we recognize that what our clients are experiencing, we are experiencing, it's a parallel process. So we're encouraging our staff to also take care of themselves to reduce their stress levels in their home, to engage in healthy um, activities whenever possible with their family and when they need the time to, to, to ask us for some time so that they can do something other than staying in, in the house quarantine doing work. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been involved with the organization for a long time, so I know how important our staff is. And they're basically the, the, the cogs and the wheels that make everything run. And they do such an amazing job. So we we'll thank them uh, for all of us uh, to, to let them know that we appreciate everything they're doing. Another question that came in is, you know, uh, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on within the community uh, with referral back and forth between agencies. Is that something that's still able to go on when everyone's so socially isolated? So we are, we are continuing to get referrals from our partners. So we are, we are continuing to partner with the Achievement Center down south in South County. We are continuing to partner with Boys Town up here in the north part of the county, out in, out in the glades with, with different organizations out there. So we are, we are staying actually in more constant contact with these agencies uh, to help whenever, however we can. And then we're also asking for them, asking them for some help whenever, whenever we need it. So we are staying in touch with them more regularly than, than ever before. Great. Um, another question that came in, I think um, that'll be the last one possibly before we move on to Sam's uh, final uh, comments. If we did receive fund, funding now, and I, I think I know where you're gonna say this is gonna go, what, where, would, where would you direct the funds uh, for the most important needs within our community right now? And I guess both of you have maybe focuses for each of your programs that you'd like to touch base on. Uh, Andres, do you want to take it first? So if, you know, when donations come in, you know, we're, this, this, this is always, this is going to be a distant memory, hopefully very, very soon. And our families are going to get back to a new normal and they're going to get back to a normal way of living. And what they're going to be faced with is back rent, back bills. And so we're going to need, I'm sure that our families right now, they're, using, they're looking for concrete services in terms of gift cards, et cetera, to buy food. But eventually they're going to need funds for uh, rents and mortgages to, to avoid eviction and avoid being, being, losing their homes, losing their housing. Okay. And Melissa? I would agree. I think Sam has uh, some good ideas when it comes to donations and how we can best help our families. Great. Yeah, I think um, in general, the way I try to explain to people when we are uh, in these situations or just in general is if you uh, don't have the basic needs like food, shelter, and, and clothing, um, you really don't you can't concentrate on anything else. Uh, so it's hard to concentrate on your mental health if you are worried about you know, getting evicted or not having enough food on the table. And I think there's a lot of studies that show, you know, if kids don't have enough food, they can't concentrate in school or learn and things like that. And I can't imagine the distractions that the kids are having right now trying to do online school 
when Wi-Fi might be spotty if you have Wi-Fi, uh, as well as just the chaos that goes on within, within their house when you have all those people in there. Uh, well, I just want to thank you guys for the presentation and answering those questions. Um, I, the next slide is going to give some information about um, some of the key contacts within our community. Um, I think everyone knows 211, but some of the other numbers are really important as well. And they'll be on this uh, information that, that we send out after this, um, after this presentation. And then uh, we will close the webinar with, with Samantha Whiteman, uh, the Director of Development for Families First, uh, just to explain how, if you're interested, you can help uh, and move and get more involved. So thank you. Sam. Dominic. Yeah, Dominic, thank you uh, for being our moderator today. Uh, I would also like to thank Melissa and Andres for giving us two eye-opening presentations. If you heard something today that you would like to learn more about, we would be happy to share additional information with you. You will receive an email from me uh, after this webinar with my contact information and other details. Melissa presented on several issues our families face every day. Imagine they began this crisis already riddled with severe trauma, and now they're faced with overwhelming amounts of issues most of us on this webinar would never dream about. I know that I have a meal today. I know that I'll have a roof over my head tonight. My eight-year-old daughter is safe and healthy. The families we work with cannot say the same. When this pandemic is over, and we are celebrating, they will not be. They will be faced with utilities being shut off, like Andres mentioned, uh, for lack of payment, and possible evictions from already rundown rentals. While we go back happily to work, they will face homelessness, extreme trauma, and suffocating depression. How can you help? It takes approximately $1,500 to $2,000 a month to feed, clothe, and shelter a family of four. So you can help by donating gift cards to Walmart, Publix, and Winn-Dixie. And the cards can be mailed directly to our office. You, can, you know, we always welcome cash donations, of course, and you can visit our website and make donations online. For those of you interested in joining a committee, email me and I can share different opportunities we have. And if you'd just like to brainstorm on how you can get more involved, I'd be welcome to have that conversation with you. I'd like to sincerely thank our funders and donors who've assisted us with the overwhelming client needs during this pandemic. We could not have continued our services without you. I'd also like to thank Castle Group for hosting this fantastic webinar and our other corporate partners, IOA, Schumacher Companies, US Bank Private Wealth Management, and Ward Damon. Thank you for joining us and please know to expect an email from me. Have a wonderful week.